Welcome to Redeeming Missions, a podcast from Every Home for Christ about the complexity of Christian missions and evangelism in our time. We host conversations that will challenge us through unique global perspectives and honest stories. Redeeming Missions is a podcast for ministry leaders, passionate evangelists, and the rest of us who might be a little bit more cautious or even disenchanted with the topic. Together, we're on a journey to find the heart of what it means to carry Christ to our world. I'm your host, Tanner Peak, and I'm so glad you're joining me today. Welcome to our second episode of Redeeming Missions podcast. I'm so, so happy that you would join us uh, once again. Today, I get the pleasure of introducing you to a dear friend of mine, a man named Danny, who was a Muslim-born Jordanian. And today is going to be a lot of talking and, and, and conversing around how he came to know Christ and what it meant for him to encounter the person of Christ right where he was in his culture. I want to prepare you, though, for Danny. He is passionate. He is zealous. I mean, you could even say he's a zealot in a way. He was the type of person that even as a little boy was searching for the divine by going uh, down to the mosque before sunrise. And so I think you're going to really enjoy his passion, who he is, and how God uh, made him to be. I, I do want to say this. There's parts of this podcast that might stretch you. And if you're part of a group of people that, that doesn't like to be stretched, I just want to prepare you. Um, this is Danny's story, and this, this is really his experience with God. And so if, if you are stretched, I just ask, buckle up. You're going to love it. You're going to love him. And I hope this really blesses you. Uh, as you listen. Enjoy. So I'm sitting here uh, with Danny. Um, I want to, I think, just to start out with at the very beginning, maybe just tell us a little bit, tell me a little bit about your story. Tell me who you are and, and how you've become the person that you are today and your journey. Um, well, um, every year when I share my um, testimony or, or how, what the Lord has done to bring me here, um, I discovered that my story has not ended yet. So yeah. Uh, yeah, if sure. you go back last year to my testimony, it's totally different. So what I'm going to say today is that um, um, I thought that God started working um, in my life when I was 15 or 16 years old, um, when I started questioning life and who God is and uh, the purpose of my life. but. Uh, I came to realize that's not the case. I believe that God has been like there working in my life since before I was born, as yeah. the Bible says. So, uh, but from my perspective, when I was uh, 15 years old, having been, you know, I, I, growing up in a Muslim family, um, you know, I was impacted by my grandmother's dedication to uh, her faith. Um, she was uh, so honest in her you know approach to god she wanted to please god mm. and i was you know touched by that i felt like she was so authentic in her faith and i wanted to be authentic uh so when i was probably 15 or 16 years old there was um probably many people remember from that uh, time when a danish cartoonist drew the prophet yeah. uh, muhammad and that started a huge demonstration uh, um, um, along, like uh, all across the Middle East and the Arab world. And at that time, I was deeply touched by a Muslim Imam uh, from Kuwait. Um, he was preaching this sermon. Hmm. Uh, the title was, O Nation of Muhammad. And I felt at that moment that I, there's nothing in life that's gonna be, uh, nothing is permanent. Everything is going to go away at one point except God, because God is eternal. This is what I thought at that time. So I decided uh, to dedicate myself completely to serving Islam hmm. and just to, you know, taking the message of Islam to all the world and just uh, hmm. inviting people to the mosque. And that what happened. I started wearing like uh, a Muslim uh, sheikh or imam. Um, you know, with the headscarf and uh, everything. And uh, I was going to the mosque five times a day. Yeah, four in the morning, you know, Muhammad had the saying. He said, tell those who go to the mosque in the dark that God is going to give them light on the 
uh, uh, latter day and I would just walk toward the mosque and I would be praying in my heart oh Allah give me light uh, in the other life in the second life um, and I, I even used to beat my brothers at four in the morning to wake them up to go with me to the mosque because wow yeah I, I once remember my brother was you know and in, in Islam when you pray you bow down so and after that you stand up and so everybody stood up and my brother kept bowing down because he was asleep he fell asleep <laughs> <laughs> so, so. it sounds like you were the really zealous brother oh yeah like really religiously fervent absolutely i was if i go <laughs> into something i go 100 percent yeah i cannot uh, stand not being so passionate so authentic about anything so that's what happened i wanted to um because you know we call it justification, right? I, I was seeking justification because I felt there was something wrong in, inside my heart. And after a year of dedicating myself to Islam, hmm. of doing everything by the book, I remember the moment, it's just like yesterday, I was sitting, uh, there was our front yard, I was sitting there and I was asking myself, now after a year of this dedication, the enmity in my heart is still there. What's going on? Why this is happening? And at that point, I gave up. I said, hmm. you know what? This is not working. So I gave up. I um, returned to my old life. But the, the what, do you, what do you call it? The zealousy? The zeal. Yeah, yeah, the zeal. Inside my heart didn't go away. Yeah. So what do you... Stop there before you go on. You, you said that... You really wanted to be right. I mean, you really wanted, you were, I mean, f fervent, zealous about being in the right relationship with God. Um, I want you, to you, feel you, it. You, you were saying you're miserable. Yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, even talk though a little I was bit young, more about that. Even though I was young. But, you know, I, I grew up in a very poor family, all right? And um, everybody, when you are poor, everybody is thinking about what? You know, becoming rich, getting more money. And... Uh, I was thinking like, if that happens to me, if I become rich, what if I end up with a sick child that's gonna make my life miserable forever? Hmm. What if I have sickness? What if I have the wrong wife? What if, uh, so a lot of options there hmm. to destroy your happiness, if your happiness is in having more money. Hmm. So I felt like, no, that's not the answer. The answer got to be somewhere else. There got to be some other um, thing. To Deeper than money. Absolutely. Deeper than success. Something eternal. Yeah. Something cannot be shaken by suffering. You know yeah. what I mean? So, um, hmm. and, and, and that was God in my mind. That's, that was Allah. Like, all right, the only thing that cannot be shaken, cannot be destroyed by suffering, and pain is God. So I wanted to dedicate myself to God, but after a year of you know be living the life to the absolute, uh, the ultimate kind of devotion, devotion yeah. I gave up because I felt like I, I was not honest. I, I, God, mm. you know, we, I didn't have that sense of justification inside of my heart. So mm. I just uh, went back to my old ways. Um, and of course, the, uh, sh the people from the mosque uh, who I spent that year with, they started, you know, coming to my home and inviting me back to the mosque and uh, telling me that, Danny, Satan is pulling you back to the word. Don't, uh, funny, it's similar sometimes to uh, what we hear at the church. Uh, mm. We sometimes use the same language without realizing that there is something wrong if you we use the same language we get, there got to be something wrong anyway so um i i just ignored what they said and um i just uh, went on in my life but god didn't wait that long before hmm. he sent somebody hmm. and i always say that the guy who saved me is a carpenter and the guy who told me about the guy who saved me was also a carpenter because wow. i i, I I just called the carpenter, uh, and this carpenter is working with every home for Christ today. So uh, I'm not going to say where, but anyway, I called him, and he um, he was a believer 
but in secret, right? Uh, low profile, very low profile. And uh, I have I've heard rumors at the time that he was not a Muslim anymore, but um, I wasn't sure. So I started, I you know, I, I started a conversation with him. I was like, "Is it true that you're not a Muslim anymore?" And he said, um, "No, no, I just had some conflict with uh, Imam at the mosque." But for three nights, he was doing some work for me at uh, a small shop I was opening. And, and he started just, you know, sending all these hints and uh, messages. And after three nights, uh, uh, because we used to work uh, until late uh, at night. So after three nights in a row, I felt like I was ready to open up. I was like ready to tell him that. I'm not satisfied. There's something wrong. Mm. But I never doubted Islam, right? At that uh, point. Um, but let me, let me just say something here. Some people think that when we leave Islam, Judaism, whatever religion we used to believe in, and we become Christians, is that we have replaced this religion. That's not correct. We don't replace uh, the old religion with mm. the Christianity. That is a misconception because... Christianity is not um, an ideology that you embrace because you don't like the old, uh, the older ideology. Uh, otherwise, you will keep moving from one ideology to another ideology forever. Yeah, Christianity is not something to replace Islam with. Christianity was something I loved, even though I was still a Muslim. Huh. You know what I mean? It's like uh, I didn't. What did you love about it? What was attracting you? That's the miraculous work of the Holy Spirit in Christianity is that you don't know if somebody asks you, you don't have the answer, but you are in love with Jesus. You know what I mean? It's like the person of Jesus Christ. Um, I remember what happened to me, even though some people know that I'm not uh, very uh, into emotional experiences and all of that, but something happened to me. I'm reformed. Yeah. Uh, some people uh, think that I... I don't enjoy experiences like this, but <laughs> this is what happened at the beginning, right? Yeah. I um, want to know more about Jesus because that guy, the carpenter, he told me, why don't you just read the Bible? Probably you would like something about it. But he said, he, he told me, listen, everything is like, I don't know, Christianity, Islam, it's all the same. He said that to me, but he didn't wow. believe it. But he wanted, you know, to keep his safety. So I want to know more, to find more about Jesus. So I went to Google and they wrote, I never knew that there was something called Jesus movie. But I wrote, film Yeshua in Arabic, it's Jesus movie. I didn't know that there was a movie. I was just, it's a shot in the darkness. Wow. I was like, probably there's something. And Jesus movie showed up, right? Uh, the, the first result in the search. And then if you know the Jesus movie, you know that it starts, uh, uh, the planets and coming down to yeah, earth yeah. and all of that and for a few minutes there was nothing I'm just watching he's talking about uh, John the Baptist then something happened when Jesus walked into the picture his back was there so it was not even the face it was just the back and he was uh, walking toward John the Baptist yeah and at that moment you see I had I have I'm having goosebumps here because at that moment, something happened I can't describe. It's like ah. there was fire in my body. There was, there was no like uh, conditions or uh, uh, reasons why this is happening because huh. I haven't had like many conversations. I wasn't trying to. Uh, nobody tried to uh, like convince me of anything. Then there was nothing. I was just trying to find out. But the moment. The figure of Jesus, not the face. I don't care about the face of that actor. It was just the figure, uh, uh, the resemblance of Jesus Christ walking into the picture. And something happened. I don't know what was that. Of course, I you know it was God. It was God's hand. But that moment was like the, um, the peak of the whole experience. Like uh, since then, I became... I, I fell in love with Jesus. I don't know why. And I started telling everybody about Jesus, even though I did not renounce Islam yet. Yeah. So that's why I'm saying it does it's not. not a, it's not an it's ideology not, that re displaced or replaced Yeah, it doesn't Islam. matter. Yeah, it doesn't matter if you don't like Islam or if you don't like Islam. So that's what I try to tell my friends who are foreigners to the Islamic culture. Yeah. If you are trying to preach the gospel, 
don't try to convince people how bad their faith is. It doesn't matter. The gospel in itself doesn't need you to over, like to, to, oversell to, it. Oversell it or to do marketing things <laughs> to make it beautiful. It's beautiful anyway. You just go to a Muslim and tell them, ask them, are you in full reconciliation with God? They will tell you, if I pray, if I do this, if I do that, if I, I will see. The gospel is you have reconciliation through Jesus Christ. You don't need to do anything right. because God has done everything in Jesus, through Jesus, so that you have full um, um, like um, a pass to go into his presence and to be his son. So anyway, don't try to replace the religion. So uh, that experience when, uh, so when I experienced that, I didn't uh, understand what happened, but the experience itself felt like so powerful that I didn't know what was going on. So again, I'm not Pentecostal, but that night I prayed. I was like, God, show me the truth. And huh. I went to sleep. No, before that, oh, it was beautiful being Pentecostal at that time. <laughs> so anyway, it's like, um, I was like watching the TV and I was like, Every time I flip a channel, something about Christianity or Jesus is showing up. I'm not kidding you. And I was like, oh my goodness, this, is, this can't be true. So I never test the Lord your God, but I was like, okay, I'm gonna flip the channel now randomly. And if there is anything about Jesus, this has got to be something, you know what I mean? And I flipped the channel randomly to a different channel and there was like the friends of Jesus coming in a series, in a show, coming to visit a king or something. And it was wow. like, oh, we are the friends of Jesus and something like that. And I was like, my mind was just So you felt up. like heaven was just speaking Absolutely. to you. Absolutely. God was like, he was he was speaking to you through your tel TV not, set. Not, not only that, but what also happens that whenever I take a cap, and you know, they play Quran. In Jordan, in my country, they play Quran all the time in the taxi cap. And, Every time I take a cap, the verses they're reading, they're reciting at that moment is about Jesus. <clears throat> it felt so powerful. I, you know, sometimes, you know, Daniel Dennett, for example, he's like uh, one of the four uh, knights of the new atheism. Uh, he said, when you think of the, things like this, these experiences, probably you are mental, mentally ill. But I'm telling Daniel, I love Daniel, all right? But, I was not mentally ill. I was not just choosing and picking the moments. It was happening to me. Hmm. It's something that I cannot explain. Hmm. And the, um, so after all of these things, again, my grandmother, I wrote a book about her. It's called hmm. The God of My Grandmother. Hmm. Um, I loved my grandmother. She was like my mother, you know what I mean? And I was terrified, like, so if Christianity is true, then my grandmother is in hell? I mm. can't believe that. I cannot accept that. Mm. If God is going to send my grandmother to hell, I don't want to believe in that God. Mm. Of course, I was emotional and I was like, because she was, she passed recently at that point. Mm. So that night, um, I went to bed. And there was a vivid dream. It's like, I don't know what the word is, like the most vivid dream that you can think of. My grandmother was looking at the sky, at the heaven. It was storm, storms, darkness, hurricanes. It's like a uh, total chaos. And she was screaming with anger hmm. at the skies. Then suddenly, she became blind hmm. and I had to carry her and I was like asking people, where is life? And somebody came and he said, there is life at the end of that river. There was a river and the top, there was the cross of Jesus Christ and I was carrying her. I don't know the interpretation of that dream. But what the message I felt at that moment, because when I woke up, she was between my hands. I still feel her mm. weight. 
was so vivid. The dream was so real. Um, so the message was, my grandmother was angry at the false heavens because she spent her life, uh, you know, and she was blind. And the life is in Jesus Christ and the cross. There was a river. I don't know her destiny. Of course, of course, I can argue from a theological point of view, especially in the Reformed circles, about if the new birth happens before faith or mm -hmm. faith happens before. No, I believe a new birth happens before. And probably my grandmother used, uh, had the new birth. All of that. I, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to leave it to God. But <laughs> I just, I'm, I'm just trying to share with you how powerful the experience was. And I'm sorry this is taking uh, too long. But the story was too long. It's like it's just the beginning. So. Yeah, but if I were to summarize, I mean, just the big things that you've brought, and I know there's so many more things that we could bring into the story, but I mean, I hear you say that you were, you were zealous for God or the form of God in justification. You wanted to be right with God. And in your culture, you did it initially through Islam. You were fervent, zealous with Islam. But then I see a, a, a series of things that actually, you know, where your, your curiosity began to change or to shift away from Islam, um, or not even necessarily away from Islam, but towards God. Yeah. I think how, as how you said it and, and towards Jesus. And you, you talk about the, the role of the, the Jesus movie, the Jesus film, and the, the way that God spoke to you there, that the, a person, there's a person in your story, the carpenter. Um, and now you're talking about dreams. I, I think just as now, I don't, I don't know if I've ever sat down and just heard <clears throat> your whole story, but it's just hard to miss the presence of, the, of God, actually, in the midst of your story. I mean, Absolutely. the way that the Lord had orchestrated things. There are things. Two, two things that I missed. Um, when I was 13 years old, before all of this happened, I was walking in my neighborhood and I found a piece of paper, a piece of literature. That's why I love uh, Every Home for Christ, yeah. because I found a piece of paper. It was not like a full uh, booklet or something. And in that paper was uh, some cartoon drawing of Jesus turning uh, water into wine. Then after a year of that incident, my father brought the Holy Bible to our home. And I was reading in the Holy Bible mm. and my uncle came and burned it. So wow. these two uh, things happened before the whole convergent thing, before the whole, you know, being touched by that Islamist uh, sheikh. So that's why I believe all these like <clears throat> pieces, they were moving toward a specific end. Yeah, you know what I mean? right. So, well, I think for, you know, our audience who hearing a story like this might be really unique. They maybe have never heard anything like this at all, um, <clears throat> I want to I wanna help bring them along and understand a little bit of the context even more. I mean, we're, we often talk about the Middle East, for mm -hmm. example, and, and I know you're, you've traveled all around the Middle East. This is your home. <clears throat> How would you explain, maybe just someone who just is curious, wants to understand, they want to understand a little bit about what the Middle East, where is it, what is it like where this guy's coming from? Just start with the real basics. In your mind, when I say Middle East, what does that include? Yeah. So, let me say that whatever you believe about God is going to be manifested in your life, right? This is yeah. what we believe. When we say the Middle East, we say the God that the majority of the Middle Eastern people yeah, worship. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So, I will give you an example <clears throat> before I explain uh, further. When I was in school, there was uh, a guy who used to bully me, another student, you know, uh, every day after school. It was horrible, just waiting until the end of the day. When I walk outside, he would be waiting for me just to bully me for years. Wow. And that oh. was, a, yeah, it was a horrible experience. During the day when we were in the class together, if he doesn't like somebody, I would try to show him that I don't like that somebody as, as well, well, so that he might like me. Yeah. If you want to understand the people in the Middle East, just think of this huh. thing. People in the Middle East, they are being bullied by their God. Huh. And their God doesn't like anybody who is not Muslim. So they're trying to show him, you see, 
we don't like them as well. Can you please like us? Wow. It's all about trying to gain the love of God and the acceptance of God. Wow. That's why I believe everything we do in our life, just like Freud said or any philosopher or any, just read the literature that we have and you will find that the drive behind everything is that we are trying to be appreciated, loved and accepted, right? Right. The same story is in, in Islam. Usually when I preach to uh, Catholics, let's say, I would say, you know, the Catholic saints are similar to Isis. Mm -hmm. And people will be like freaking out, like, what? I was like, let me explain. Isis, the ultimate goal of Isis members, I'm not talking about some politics, political agendas here and there. I'm talking about the members who really sacrifice their lives for the uh, purpose of serving Allah. And the purpose of the saints, of the Catholic the priests of mm -hmm. the Catholic Church is to please God. So both of them are trying to please God the way their gods are asking them to please them. Yeah. So both of them are after the same thing and that is to be loved and accepted and forgiven. Hmm. So the first thing you need to understand about the people in the Middle East is that they are trying to find love. Hmm. They're not loved. I think that's a really beautiful and compassionate way of looking at a group of people that I think coming from an American standpoint and maybe from news, whether it's the news media or even, even sometimes I think the way that Christians even talk about the Middle East, it's almost dehumanizing. Yeah. It's like these, these people, if they just thought better, if they were smarter, if they, you know, if they just turned away from Islam to God. I like what you're saying. There's something behind oh, yeah, their, their approach. I mean, their, their, even their attachment to Islam that has way more to do with, I want to be loved and I want to be accepted. Um, I think that's a lot more compassionate engagement with an entire group of people than being right or wrong. Oh, even, yeah. even if being right or wrong is a part of what's going on, it's, it's a lot more compassionate way to see these, your grandmother, the, these people really desperately want to be loved. To be loved, yeah. You know, um, so I have been going to therapy for two years. Praise God, me too. And yeah, it's, it was what I discovered um, through therapy. I haven't discovered it through my 15 years of Christian life. Yes. Because what I discovered about the gospel, because I, therapy, showed me what went wrong and the gospel healed everything. But it was, anyway, that was a different story. But anyway, what I want to say is this. Therapy showed me that there was a pattern that I am repeating in everything around me, right? So my mother That's right. used to, you know, be a little, like, she out of ignorance, not lack of love, you know, being violent. And I kept attracting toxic people who are similar to yeah, that. Yeah, replicating or mimicking. And trying yeah. to please. It's like my friends, everybody. It's like even everything. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm sorry. So what I'm trying to say through this example is that the people in the Middle East, they are replicating their relationship with God, the abusive relationship yep. they have with God, with everything else. So I, I shouldn't be blamed. Now, I'm not, I'm not trying to get rid of uh, responsibility. There are uh, like consequences, but I mean, I shouldn't be blamed for things that I'm unaware of. Yeah, like you they are formed. happening because uh, something happened. It's the same thing. Huh. So if on 9-11 at eight in the morning, before the planes took off, you sat with the 19 uh, people, and ask them, what is your ultimate goal? They would say, to please God. Hmm. Maybe you see the hatred toward America. Maybe you see um, whatever you want to see. Th at the root, there is trying to get right with God, trying hmm. to be justified. That's why the Protestant Reformation, when he rediscovered the gospel. It's justification by faith alone. When we say justification by faith alone, it is. It is the answer to all of the humanity biggest questions. Yeah. I 
I was, you know, struggling with a sin in my life and was praying, God, please help me. I want to stop doing this. I want to, and I couldn't for years. And then it hit me. God said to me, listen, listen, son, if I let this go, if you stop sinning, you're going to think that I love you because you stopped. Until you realize that I love you regardless of yeah. that sin, I, I, it's not, it's not going to work. So when I realized his love, regardless of that sin, so that message is when you take it to Islam, they don't care about the history of Islam, what Muhammad did or didn't, if he was a beautiful yeah. guy or not. <laughs> they know they don't care. So that's why in my approach toward Islam, I do this. I tell them, listen, Islam is so beautiful. Four wives, are you kidding me? Amazing. I'm not mimicking them. It's it, it, because we are depraved the human beings. Yeah. I'm telling you, four wives, amazing, right? <laughs> but, but listen. <laughs> You are not loved by your God based on, you don't have value in yourself. Yeah. Your value is attached to what you do, to your performance. So yeah. if it is performance-based salvation, you hate it. Even if you don't, if you're not aware of it, just the moment I highlight it, you hate it. Now, let me tell you something else, something different. You are valuable regardless of, uh, what do you do or you don't? You're loved. Yeah. And that is not performance based. They wouldn't care about what Islam is good, bad. Yeah. So we will stop being polemic in yeah. our in our message. Yeah. Americans, if if Americans who are a Christian loving God wants to preach the gospel to Islam, you cannot keep saying you're tourists, you're Arabs, camels, hands, and all of that thing yeah. and expect them to Actually, you are helping them to grow into that, to yeah. grow into terrorists, to grow into uh, yeah. a bunch of uh, uh, hateful people. No, we use a different thing. We are all the same. And this is what the Bible says in Romans, uh, first uh, chapter of Romans. It says, like, all of us under the wrath of God, right? Yeah. So Tanner is similar to Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. It's all the same. It's like your, your good deeds are not different than his bad deeds. You're all the same trying to justify yourselves. Now, because you're a Christian, God is doing things through you. Hmm. So it's not even you, right? You don't take credit for the good works right. that you do. So you're still the same as Abu Bakr Baghdadi, but you're loved because of what Jesus has done, not because of what you're doing. Hmm. And that is what Abu Bakr Baghdadi is trying to find. So he's trying to find value, he's trying to find meaning, he's trying to find uh, love and appreciation and acceptance from his God. But his God is saying, listen, if you don't do this, I'm going to put you in hell. I'm going to throw you in the eternal hell. And that, is, that freaks people out. And people who are full of violence, who were uh, like violently abused, they will, you know, just reflect what has been, uh, you know, so into them, what has been poured into them. This is such an, a, a, an interesting point, though. I mean, I, first of all, I love that <laughs> Middle Eastern man, American man, both going to therapy. I mean, we have a lot of com in common there, so I like that one. But w one of the things that you said, I think in the middle of, of this conversation, and you keep bringing up this theme, and it, it's so profound. You keep speaking about the way that the, the, the people, the Middle Eastern people, or the Islam, people practicing Islam are abused by their God. And what I hear you saying is that they were abused by their God and just like in, you know, in, in another circumstance of abuse, oftentimes it's abusers, or the, the people who are abused themselves become abuse. abusers. Yeah. They end up mimicking or replicating. They're, they're in a way formed by their image of God. Uh, and, and in this case, if the image of your God is abusive and he withholds love and he asks and he demands service, what do you, expect you, you do the exact same yeah. thing in your world. I think it's so profound what you're saying. When you bring the gospel, you're actually bringing a gospel that's healing it's, and mending it's of relationship. To the culture. It's connected to the culture. Uh, many Christians say, when you go to a Christian city, it's beautiful. When you go to a Muslim city, it's garbage everywhere. Yeah, let me tell you why. Because the gospel is the answer. Here's why. If you think that 
this life is just a waste of time you're going to hell so you have to focus on going to heaven so you have to do the you know traditions the religious traditions things and focus yeah. on the uh, religious part of your life to avoid going to hell you wouldn't care about you know just making a beautiful garden or, or like sweeping the streets of garbage you would think about how to save yourself but the christian culture and it is a very tricky thing the christian uh, the western civilization especially now nowadays like finland denmark sweden all these infidel countries they would say ah we are uh, secular we don't believe in christianity we are not the result of a christian faith uh we don't need a christianity and timothy killer uh he uh, reply his response to them was like what about the 2000 years of christian uh, right. culture yeah that's right right christian history that helped you to so back to that that point so the christian culture because it's based on grace and love yeah even people who don't believe in the gospel they are still gracious they are still um you know have you seen 12 angry men the 12 angry men that is the christian justice system whether you like it or not whether huh. they mention jesus or not um when in the west you go to a court house it doesn't matter if you're a king or uh whatever your, your uh, like job is the judge is gonna treat you with the same value why because christianity produced the christian justice system what you call the western justice system that's not true it's, it's christian Friedrich nietzsche said there's nothing such as a human right if you are an uh, an atheist, atheist. You know, you shouldn't be believe in the human rights. Human rights is a Christian product. Yeah. So that's why Christians, they take care of their cities. They, they, mm -hmm. they have like a bitter justice system, bitter social justice, um, because they are, um, they are not so focused and concerned about their uh, metaphysical uh, dimension, because that is secured by the power of Jesus Christ. Yeah. So, if you want to help, that's why when Americans went to Afghanistan and spent $2.2 trillion and they ended up with a stupid strategy to teach how a man can be pregnant at the University of Kapol, that was a stupid approach. If you want to change that culture, you start from the gospel. You go there and you teach them how they are loved and accepted and uh, you don't teach them that uh, liberal agenda. I'm, I'm not going to go political here, but I mean, <laughs> you don't spend $2 trillion and use uh, um, something to waste uh, your resources. We, we need the gospel. The word, everyone in the world needs the gospel. And you know why, why atheist nations who have uh, no Christian culture are also prosperous? Because atheism and its modern shape is actually built on christian factors even though they uh, for example in japan they uh, they're not christian they were not christians but that uh, the things that they believed in the value of the human being is coming from christianity yeah so um this Dan is danny what about as you're sitting here talking to me my, my heart's actually really stirred with compassion when you when you translate that conversation about the Middle East, and we're talking about Islam and a, lo a lot of things. When you translate that into the language, though, of a people that are desperate to find love and the God that they keep going to is abusive. I mean, that's in your, your story, in your language. I, it's hard to not feel just deep compassion um, about, about that. There's terminology that sometimes we use in, 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 mission, in the missions world, missiological language. We might talk about the Middle East as closed, you know, or it's a closed door, a closed door to the gospel. Um, you're familiar with this terminology. Uh -huh. But as I'm thinking about this, I, I think it's actually even a sad, almost a sad phrase. Um, I, I get what it represents. I get w the way that it's even being used in a missiological circle. but. It's not so much that the Middle East is closed to the gospel. Um, it's, it seems like it's something completely different. It seems like it's actually desperate for the gospel, but maybe stuck absolutely. in a cycle of darkness or a cycle of pain. <clears throat> Am I representing that well? Absolutely. Let me give you an example. 
Let's say there's a woman who uh, lost her son in an accident. Now, that woman is so desperate to believe that, you know, he's dead. And you come to her door and you knock and you say, your son is alive. Her reaction would be like, violent. She would be like, you're lying to me. You can, that cannot be true because he's yeah. dead. And her reaction is actually coming out of desperation because as you just yeah. explained it. So I want you to imagine that when you take the gospel to this Muslim word. You are loved and forgiven for nothing because of what Jesus has done. What? You're lying. That cannot be true. But they represent it in a different way. They just, you know, react. And so don't look at the surface. Yeah. Deep at the root, man. It's the same desperation. So it's uh, like... Which maybe even grief. I mean, when you, when you talk about it that way, the, one of the reasons that woman responds so strongly is because of the grief, one, the grief that she's experiencing, but maybe the grief, uh, uh, accepting the rea this accepting reality, this reality. Accepting the good news. Let's, yeah. say, let's say accepting the good news at that point is so scary. Why? Because, because if it's not true, it's disastrous. Right. right? If the gospel is not true, it's disastrous. It's catastrophic. Yeah. Because you would be wasting your time instead of trying to save yourself you wasted your time believing that you wow. are saved so that's why uh, we need to keep knocking and keep preaching the good news because at one point they will be like all right i'm gonna check it out if it's true it's fantastic right, right? it's it's beautiful but my first reaction is what are you talking about and there's another thing by the way there's another thing uh, that the Bible explains perfectly, Paul explains perfectly, when he talked about self-righteousness. Yeah. It's like, there are people, even Christians, even inside our churches, and Muslims, similar. They have been making efforts, praying, going to mosques and churches, doing all these things that their gods ask them to do. And then you bring the gospel and you say, hey, listen, this means nothing. <laughs> yeah, right. It's only Jesus. They will be furious. They will be yeah. like, what? Are you kidding me? All this effort. You know why? Because the motivation behind it was not love. It was fear. That's right. We are addicted to the law. You know? Because as long as I'm performing, I get credit. I'm saved. I'm safe. I'm safe. I'm secured. Wow. Now, when you come to such a person and tell them, oh, listen, this is nothing. This is garbage. God doesn't care about this. He loves you not because of any of this. It's because of the works of another. They will be like furious. Like you're taking your, you are as, like separating them from their shield of, of salvation. Yeah. So it's the same thing with Muslims. When you go to Muslims who were praying five times a day, going to the mosque in dark and all of that, and you tell them, this means nothing. It's about what Jesus has done. They will be like furious. Like, no, you cannot take this from me. This is so precious to me. I have been collecting these for years and years. Don't steal them. Well, I imagine, and we probably both have our own kind of metaphor, our own stories in this. I imagine you gave so much time and so much energy and even so much emotion, desperation towards, you know, a project or a thing. Yeah. And then for it to be wiped out. I mean, that's why I say there's an element Just of... Just the garbage. Yeah, yeah I and mean, we would feel like... All of that was a waste. My whole life or all of this, all of the sacrifice, it meant nothing. And that I think is good for whether someone's in America or in the or, Middle East. Or wherever, it's yeah. to be maybe a little bit more compassionate and nuanced. And when we come to someone with the good news, the good news is good. Like you said, we don't have to market that or dress it up. Absolutely. It is yeah. fundamentally good. But I think maybe being sympathetic to the person who says, are you kidding me? And they, were, they push back strongly and say, are you kidding me? All of my life of working hard was for, you're telling me it was always this easy. But th at the core, they're tired. Tired, yeah. People who have a lot of credit in their bank, they are tired of that credit. Yeah. They want to get rid of it. Because yeah, they're you know dead. Why? Yeah. It's, like, um, it's like the stock market. Uh, so, for example, I'm trading in the stock market. I, I made $1,000. I'm afraid of going into another 
uh, trade because I don't want to lose the thousand dollars. So it's so tiring. So yeah, yeah. sometimes when I lose the thousand dollar, I'm happier. <laughs> I don't you know. know me. Uh, there's there's uh, uh, a great <laughs> a great story, uh, and I love this as a metaphor for the gospel and how even Muslims uh, that like they can relate to this. It's like in New York City. I've read this in uh, some book. I can't remember. In New York City, taxi drivers they make the same amount of money during summer or winter, even mm. though work during summer is many times more. But mm. they end up doing the same amount. You know why? Because they are coming to work from a debt identity. They want to make $130 to be safe. That's enough to pay the rent and to pay for food. And so once they hit $130 a day, they stopped working. So during summer or winter, even though in summer they could make $500. So when you are afraid, you will only try to be saved. Like, oh, I'm, I'm okay now? Okay, good, I'm done. Yeah. That's why Paul said, the thieves should not be thieves anymore, but should work and give. How you can get somebody who are a thief to work and give? You don't, uh, let them be dry, driven by fear, but by love. Like, listen, if you are a thief or not a thief, it's uh, it's about Jesus, not about you. At that point, they're like, there's uh, what they call it, uh, uh, shift paradigm. What do you call it? Yeah. It's like, it's like paradigm, shi pa paradigm, paradigm shift. shift. There's like a shift in, in, in your understanding of the whole thing. And that's why Muslims, they're so resistant to the gospel because the gospel is gonna separate them from their righteousness, probably make their God very angry at them. You know, what if you're wrong, Tanner, and you want me to denounce my Allah, and oh my goodness, I'm gonna be like, he's gonna just slay me. He's gonna send me to hell a thousand times more. So don't talk to me. Yeah. I'm gonna kill you if you talk to me. You know what I mean? So that's how we need to approach the uh, Islamic word. That's why theology is very important. A prayer is important because theology is not enough, but theology is important hmm. because without understanding the difference in the theological approach toward God, man, uh -huh. and Jesus, you cannot share the gospel. I'm, I'm sick of people who go to somebody who is a fornicator and tell them, you need to believe in Jesus and stop fornicating. What are you talking about? If you are like committing adultery or not committing adultery, you are an adulterer. Because Jesus said that, even if you look, you're an adulterer, right? right? Yeah. That's what he said to the Jews. Yeah. So it's not about, you know, stopping adultery. The gospel is not about what you should do. It's, it's about what Christ has done. You would say it's not about behavioral modification. Absolutely. It's, it's about accepting Christ's love into your life. Amen. In the real darkness, pain, uh, maybe even trauma uh, of abuse. Oh yeah, sure, absolutely. I mean, it's it's a very different paradigm, I think, though, than than some might have when it comes to missions and when they talk about the gospel. I mean, what you're talking about is radical to so many. It's a deeper. It's a gospel that's deeper if, than if just you, and then just a right and a wrong. Absolutely. If you don't um, preach the gospel, the a naked gospel, you will miss the point. Um, Martin Lloyd-Jones said, if people don't take you for an antinomian after your sermon, then probably you have not preached the gospel. Hmm. And what did he mean by that? Yeah. Is that you need to be so radically, just similar to Paul. You know, I never preach behaviors and good works, never, unless people understand the gospel. Yeah, right. Like, if they don't understand the gospel 100%, I don't bother trying to tell them to be honest or whatever. Because, you know, what therapy showed me is that you cannot survive not being honest. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> That's what it, it revealed that to you too. Yeah. All right, okay, we both, figure, like, we both like, figured that out. You can. It's like, <laughs> and what, what Jordan Peterson said, Jordan Peterson said it beautifully. He said, you can never like uh, uh, twist the fabric of reality and have it not snap back at you at one point. And it's, so we don't 
need to bother keep preaching about work and because you know what that does it just add more self-righteousness to people that's right at our office in lebanon we have something called the wall of shame if you come to visit us you will see the wall of shame and the wall of shame you will see photos of our employees on the wall of shame and you will be like what they are on the mm. wall of shame and then you will see a photo of somebody and you will read the story and it's a beautiful story he did something great we hear a story from the field about something he did and we put it on the wall of shame and why is he on the wall of shame because so the last one got on the wall of shame his name is Ali Ali helped this this family dedicated his time gave like made effort to help them outside of even the work hours so we put that beautiful story in the wall of shame and then we say listen Ali you're gonna feel self-righteous because we are appreciating what you're doing we are appreciating what you're doing but you should go on the wall of shame because there is no righteousness in whatever you do it's only glory to God so the whole concept is that don't try to get a credit for anything good that you're doing because God is the one who is working in you, in you to do not you it's not you so now and this is the last sermon I preached at the office uh, during the staff meeting said now we're gonna fight to see who's gonna be on the wall of shame so even in the bad things we're gonna fight to see who's gonna win if I am a thief and you're a thief and we are bragging about who is the bigger thief you we will be like fighting who's the bigger thief right yeah because we need the glory yeah. so it's all about the glory of God the, the glory we want to steal the glory from uh, God that's the basic sin and is and Muslims in the Middle East everything you see try to see the theological part behind it they are trying to get some glory probably that glory is gonna save them it's all about being saved from the wrath that we so deeply feel that we deserve yeah and um, politics can distort facts um, cultural gaps or cultural differences shouldn't be a hindrance to a Christian um, I remember a, a pastor from Lebanon he was preaching at a conference in uh, Oklahoma City and there was a Christian lady in the church and when he finished she came to him and he was like terrorist you're a terrorist in Arab what it's like what are you talking about Jeez. so this is if we are Christians then we need to understand that all human beings regardless of race color background they are all under the wrath of God unless Jesus Christ saves them yeah. so this is how you've been so generous in giving bringing your story and I think even bringing your your just your beautiful perspective and I, uh, regarding the Middle East and and I think bringing a really compassionate yet gospel filled um, perspective to to approaching the Middle East and I, I just don't see it I just have a hard time seeing it as a closed door I think it's a it's a door that needs to be knocked on but it's, it's closed waiting but to be we know on. why it's yeah. closed it's closed because people behind the closed door they are afraid and the violence is not authentic the yeah. violence is uh, the result of fear and reactive and and reactive um, do, you, do you have let's let's maybe finish this way do you have any stories I'm putting you on the spot a little bit sure go ahead just any stories recently that come to your mind about the way that the love of Christ is meeting someone within your culture um, in a unique way um, you probably have a thousand stories oh yeah but one of the like amazing stories that I think about uh, recently we, uh, it happened re like few months back and I keep thinking about it because um, an Imam he's actually leading a mosque in one of the cities in the Middle East I'm not gonna say the country and he's tell an Imam and he responded to uh, our uh, online campaign and then we started meeting with him and uh, he believed in Jesus and became a Christian and he still preaches in the mosque every Friday so he is still because he cannot leave he cannot stop you know being an Imam so the last time we met together 
he was uh, actually we were arguing about the doctrine of election <laughs> but <laughs> that friday what on, what on earth? that friday he was going to preach at the mosque and he said listen i cannot stay. if i stop they're gonna like find out they're gonna ask questions so i don't know what to do so i asked him what are you gonna preach about this friday then he said i don't know i'm gonna preach about religious freedom or something. I was like, <laughs> so, so That's this guy is like, uh, that the reason why he believed in Jesus is that he said, every time I preach, because you know, it's all work-based uh, religion. So everything I preach about and I want people to, you know, stop doing or he said, it's the same thing I'm struggling with. So he's saying, I'm just projecting. Right. So he said, I never felt um, like honest in, in yeah. what I'm preaching. And the gospel, the correct understand of the gospel is that you can never stop. You cannot stop. It's going to be there. Whether you manifest it outside or it's there, it's going to be there. The nature is that way. And regardless of that nature, you have a new identity that is love that cannot even sin the new identity. So you don't, uh, if, you, if you sin, it's not you who sin, it's the yeah. sin that is in you. Yeah. And he said, that was the answer to my struggle. And now his um, passion is, or his heart, his desire is to how to communicate the gospel to people who go to mosques. And that is one of the craziest. I things. think that would bend people's minds. I love it. I, I, I think I, it's amazing. I mean, this I is where believe, people are. I can't believe this guy. Actually, he he even afraid to come to our center. So whenever he wants to visit, he has to change the way he dress, and he has to come at night when there is no one visiting the center. All the employees left. Just to a couple of us meet him. So <laughs> it's I can't believe. Uh, he is still, uh, I haven't seen him in like a couple months, but the last time we saw him, it's like, what, how, <laughs> what? <laughs> Are you going to just... Uh, what a beautiful story. So uh, this is just one of many, many stories that... Danny, thank you for sharing. Thank you for bringing your heart. Thank you very much. Sitting on this uh, stiff rock, my butt's numb. For sure, I can't feel my butt now, but thank you so much for, thank you, for Tanner, the for, conversation. It's, uh, it's uh, an honor and a pleasure to be here on this uh, podcast. Thank you Amen. very much. Hey there, I hope you enjoyed that conversation. There's a couple things in that conversation that I am very aware that stick out to me. And for those of you who might be missiologists or, or students of missiology, there's a couple things in that statement that might have really challenged or really confront your beliefs. And I, in this podcast, I don't want to run away from the controversial topics. I don't want to back away from them. I'm not saying I agree with one side or the other, uh, but some of what was said there about um, the way that the gospel is embedded within Islam or the way that it lands and um, even his the conversation about ideology, some of that might be really hard uh, for you as you listen. So I just want to acknowledge that. I don't want to back away from that. Um, I think this is a, a, a beautiful story coming from a man's authentic experience with Christ, having grown up in Jordan. And so I hope you enjoyed that. I hope you enjoyed these podcasts. I ask that you, to, if you like what you heard, just share it with your friends, share it with others. Um, and we look forward to uh, having you listen in again. Thank you for joining us today on the Redeeming Missions podcast. If you like what you've heard, we encourage you to subscribe so you can stay up to date on all future episodes. Echoing in the prayer of St. Patrick, Christ with us, Christ before us, Christ behind us, Christ in us. Let us carry Christ to our world. Until next time.